Hello and welcome back to Far Beyond the World. We will be continuing where we left off, which, if you recall, is after uh, Kaylin and Rannoch had a little conversation while they were eating. And basically, Rannoch's not going to budge on the whole, you know, I have to leave you here for the better and well, for the better of the village and, you know, because I want to keep you safe and blah, 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 blah. Because, I mean, you're basically dumping a human who's only like two weeks old at the most in a strange new place without anybody to protect them with like nobody trustworthy around because although the city is you know quote unquote safe it's still very much a new place for Kalen. and given that he is lacks some uh very basic uh, survival skills it's probably gonna be very bad but anyway um what do you guys think is gonna happen also this particular episode is where a certain tiger comes out that brings a lot of um, discourse with it because of like a sort of shift in the conversation or in the way that the story flows. It just, it, eh. you guys will have to see for yourself. So yeah, without further ado, let's continue. He seems as much given up on the subject as I am, and soon, we're making ready to call it a night. I look to him with mild confusion, holding the folded tunic in my arms, as a wolf removes a blanket from the bed and unfurls it onto the floor. What are you doing? I ask almost indifferently, as he winces slightly. I think it's inappropriate. I thought we agreed to not dick around like that, but I make pointless gestures of... What exactly? I scoff. Is you sleeping on the floor meant to be your penance? Stupid. I quip in annoyance, and the wolf cringes slightly, picking up the blanket. If you would rather we share a bed, then... I don't care what you sleep. Do what you please, but don't make mockery of all the time we spend together. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm being silly. The wolf sighs in resignation and tidies the bed again, while simply clamber in. I take to one side of it, allowing for him to rest besides if he so chooses, but my back is turned firmly towards him. My concession is of good nature, not of some desperate attempt at making up. I don't want him sleeping rough for no real reason. The bed is big enough. I'm sorry it has come to this, truly. He mutters, laying down besides me, as the mattress wobbles slightly under his weight. But... You must understand that there is nothing that would justify us coming back together. His voice wavers pitifully and I clench my lips. You need to come to terms with that fact that you'll stay here. The sooner the better. I don't respond, desperately trying to keep the moisture out of my eyes. Again, there's not much else to say. Our journey is at its end, and as heavy a thought as it is, it finally sinks in. Despite a heavy heart, sleep comes hard to me, while the rhythmic tapping of the rain continues outside. Even the feather bed, which is much more welcoming than the tent ever was, cannot send me off to the land of Nod. Rannoch, emotionally and physically exhausted, snores softly besides me, with his massive chest expanding in a soothing rhythm. But I just stare blankly at the ceiling, mulling over the fact that tomorrow we will part ways. Try as I can, no matter how many different scenarios I play in my head, I cannot find any reason that would allow for my safe return. Just like he predicted. Perhaps Rannoch placated his father, but Vidri, that's another issue entirely. Although I understand his protectiveness of Korra, somehow his sudden shift of attitude towards me leaves a pit in my stomach. There's a fear buried deep inside me that we're looking at it all wrong. Vithrir is not what he seems and, at least according to Aeroth and Taliesin, doesn't always have the good of his tribe at heart. Which makes me doubly convinced that being sent away is not what's best for the wolves. It could just be wishful thinking, but something doesn't feel right. I can't see Vithrir being a traitor. After all, he saved Varrock's life. He killed for his friend and shares a deep emotional wound with him. But one doesn't have to be a traitor to be troubled. Whatever those two old wolves have in store, 
It feels like it's involving me being out of the picture. And somehow, I can't see it adding up to a happy ending for everyone involved. I don't want any harm to come their way, but Rannoch seems completely blinded by his loyalty to both of his daddies. Knowing I would be stuck here without any means to help them just eats me inside. Yes, it's a strenuous, torturous night, and the more I realize how helpless my situation is, the more bottomless my pit of despair grows. I don't want to be left alone here. I don't want to start again as an orphan with no one to count on. With no one to ground or to comfort me. As warm trickles of tears finally slide across my face, I bury myself into the pillows and try to rein in my emotions to no avail. I sob there quietly for some amount of time, until desperate and broken, I finally fall asleep. I lay there in the dark and troubled dream, suffocating void crushing down upon my chest. But I am not alone. Why do you cry, child? Why do you suffer so? A strange yet familiar voice echoes through the darkness. W what Who's there? I try to peer into the surrounding void, but the thick pitch almost sticks to my eyes. It's your mother, dear. Finally, the image of a Sipcon woman emerges from the nothingness. I hang my head and sigh heavily. I had a feeling you'd come back to torture me. Torment? It's not me who broke your heart now, is it, Kaelin? Why the disguise? You know I've already seen through it. It brings you comfort, doesn't it? She shrugs casually, her lips curling into an almost kind smile. Isn't that what you need right now? Some comfort? And you're meant to give it to me? I can give you more than anyone ever could. The woman spreads her arms invitingly, and I can't help but scoff in mild amusement. Why the sudden change of tune? I tried being the disciplinarian. Now I'm trying motherly love. We can make this work, Kaylin. Somehow, each time she utters my name, I feel as if a needle is stuck into my brain. I feel sick and queasy, with all my innards churning. We both know you're not my mother. I can be anything you want me to be. She replies softly, and just like that, her form shifts to that of a grey wolf. He stands there, his strong arms confidently resting against his hips. Is this better? His warm timber resonates through the nothingness and my eyes well up in anger. H how dare you take his form? Too soon? The false wolf sniggers and I swing at his smug muzzle. But before I land a hit, the figure melts away into nothingness, a soft chuckle bouncing off into eternity. I knew you wanted to hurt me. I do nothing of the sort. But they... I blink, seeing a form of Verissa. Then Vol appear at the different ends of this dark pit of despair. They are a different matter entirely. Korra. Tano. It's too much. I fall to my knees, tears flowing down my cheeks. What the fuck is going on? Poor Kaelin. Finally, the familiar, female figure reappears in front of my eyes. Led astray by the very people he so eagerly trusted. Stop calling me that. I snap out, again feeling the name akin to a hot brand pushing into my skin. You're alone here. You know that, with no one you can really rely on, no one you can trust. It's just you and me. Let me be your comfort. Mother always knows best. You're not my mother. I yell out in anger, but as much as I want to stand up and square off with the entity, I cannot, feeling my strength abandoned me, almost as if drained. You're not my mother. I repeat in a more pitiful tone. Not the one I once had, nor a new one in this cosmic sense. 
I know you weren't the one who brought me here. I feel it in every fiber of my being. That may be true. I blink, looking to the creature with surprise and the woman's smiles. If it's honesty you strive, you shall have it. But tell me, where is the one who gave you this new life you cherish so? You were left abandoned, guideless and alone, like so many unwanted children are. I may not have given you life, but I'm the closest thing to mother you'll ever have. As surreal as it seems, I feel as if the nothingness surrounding me closes in. It's hard to breathe, and I almost sink into the blackened floor, but then another voice pierces through the void. Kaylin. What? I look up, as if towards the source of the sound, and so does she. And so the lives begin anew. The woman speaks through a casual shrug. The only lie here is you. I'm done playing games. Leave me alone. Leave? Kaylin? You and I are one? She smiles, but I'm having none of it. Leave me alone and never come back! Wake up, please. Her false light cannot beget happiness. Only pain shall await you there, and within the shadows, I will be watching. I don't care. I shout out, and this time a bright flash of light shoots through the darkness for but a moment, stunning both of us. I want to wake up. I state, and to my surprise, she nods. Very well then, run along, little firefly. But you'll see, you'll beg me to come back soon enough. And then she fades to black. I wake up restless and unsettled, my rattled chest almost like a cage with a startled canary inside. Relax. Breathe. The wolf asks in a worried tone, pointing towards his own chest. He's guiding me down from yet another panic attack. Do you remember? I nod, following cues from his own relaxed inhales. That's right. Slow and steady. Breathe. He continues his encouragement, and eventually I sigh heavily, finally composing myself enough to look around. It's pitch dark, and the wolf hovers above me, reminiscent to our very first night. Sharing a bed in our current situation is awkward enough, but having Rannoch looking at me with his worried, knowing eyes is even more so. Everything all right? He asks in that genuinely concerned tone of his, and I cringe a little. You've been panting heavily the last few minutes. I tried to wake you up, but nothing worked. Yeah, I'm fine. Just a bad dream. I straighten up, looking at the darkness beyond the window. It's still middle of the night. He mutters, following my gaze with his. I bet he can sense how upset I am, as my heart almost feels ready to leap out of my chest. And just like that, he confirms it with another question. You sure everything's fine? Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. I shake my head and rub my face. I don't want to waste time mulling over my feelings. They're not exactly relevant right now, despite the wolf's prodding for details. I see no point in discussing it, not when it's absolutely clear that I'll have to deal with all of this on my own anyway. You seem a little freaked out. He mutters as I struggle to crawl from underneath him and get up to my feet. I walk up towards the table and pour myself a glass of water, which I drink up thirstily. There's a mist gathering in front of my face, and despite the embers still burning inside the braziers, it has gotten incredibly cold. Without a word, I pick up the dress and decide to put it on. My fingers jitter so badly that I am unable to clip the pins together. Okay, not a little, a lot. You're setting my fur on edge. It's fine. I told you I'm fine. I snap, only to have him look at me pitifully. You're not. You're trembling and crying. You're very much in the same state as you were when we first met. What? Instinctively, I bring my hands to my cheeks, and there they are, two wet streaks trickling down, and I'm not even aware of it. I'm so stunned and surprised by my state that all I can think of 
is to lash out. And you're surprised by that? You're surprised that I'm falling to pieces when you've pulled a rug from underneath me? Seriously? I thought we were past this. He sighs, rubbing the ridge of his nose. Not by a mile. If that's how you want it to be. What? I want nothing of the sort, but my wants clearly don't matter. Okay, enough. This time, it's him who raises his voice. If you don't want anything to do with me, just say it. But don't jeopardize my mission. My people's life depend on it. The wolf looks at me with a serious expression, and I sneer. Of course, I wouldn't want to be the usual burden that I am. You can get me arrested acting the way you do. My people aren't looked upon kindly in this town. Gee, I wonder why. I... I really cannot deal with this right now. He sighs heavily, hiding his muzzle deep in his palms. I have enough worries as it is. Everything hinges on the audience with the magistrate tomorrow. My father's future. My friends' lives. Hate me if you'd need to, but please, try to collect yourself. His voice softens and he finally gets up, taking a few steps towards me. Tomorrow might be the last time we see each other for a very long while. I want it to be a good day, for the both of us. Like all the ones when you strung me along? I taunt challengingly, and he stops in his tracks. I did what I had to, to give you some good memories that you were clearly begging for. I want to help you through whatever it is that you're struggling with. When I found you, you were weeping at the sight of the rain. You think that you... No, I won't be doing this. He cuts me off through a soft growl as he collects his gear. I won't be dragged into yet another argument. There were more important things at stake here than my standing with you. I never intended to hurt you. The wolf states plainly, turning his back to me as he approaches the door. Either you'll figure that out on your own, or you won't. That's your choice. I did everything I could to make amends. He says with a hint of hurt in his voice before stepping outside. I stand there, looking at the door in shock as they close behind him. Once alone, my rattled chest begins to heave uncontrollably. How dare he? All this patronizing is insufferable. My face contorts painfully and I feel another episode of hysteria approaching. I try as best as I can to control it, but... Surrender to the pain. Let it flow like a twin river. No. No. I watch as the remnants of the brightness are being sucked out of the room, and everything begins to twist and turn. No. No, no. I can't stay in this room. The walls seem to close in on me. I rush towards the door, struggling to take a hold of the door handle. Finally, with a firm grip, I manage to turn it, pulling on the door with all my might as the room presses against it as if it were underwater. It's a Herculean task to even crack it a little, but eventually a big enough gap allows me to squeeze through. The door slams violently behind me as I fall onto the corridor, immediately throwing myself towards the only window. My hands tremble as I try to unlatch it and get some fresh air. The panel moans as I slide it upwards, pushing my head outside to take greedy inhales. Once I feel the gentle breeze cool me down, I return back inside, sliding gently along the wall. But when I open my eyes, I realize that I'm not alone. A female tigress stands at the other end of the corridor, a smoking pipe in hand, giving me a troubled look. Fuck, I made a spectacle of myself yet again. What? She asks in a quite demanding tone, and I realize that I've been dead staring at her for a few moments now. I is that tobacco? I blurt out a question, and she rolls her eyes, taking a long, exasperated puff. Ugh, not another one. It is or it isn't. What of it? Nothing. It's just... I recognize the smell. Indeed I do. It is tobacco, and again, this odd, past-life feeling washes over me. You're in some kind of trouble, kid. N no Why do you think I am? You're clearly broken about something, and I could hear you sobbing halfway through the night. Put a real damper in the mood. Had to refund one customer. One cus- Oh, oh, oh. She's a prostitute. Probably the very same one we heard last night. 
I'm quite stumped, and my embarrassed expression causes a female to first snort and then erupt in laughter. <laughs> What's so funny? At first, I thought you were another whore like me, just a fancy type, a bit more exotic, thus able to charge more. How else would you be able to afford that dress? She points to my tunic and I instinctively grab its edges to spread it out a little. Oh, this? It was a gift. Hmm, whores don't get gifts like that. Not the ones in here, anyways. Seeing your shock laden face tells me you really don't belong here, do you? No, I mean, not in my mind, but truth be told, this might become my new home soon enough anyway. I smile awkwardly, and she smiles back, approaching slowly. The accent and your manners also tell me you're of higher stock. So, how did a well-born, well-bred human end up in a dump like this? It's a long story. She takes a deep inhale from her pipe, releasing a thick cloud to the side. Hey, I've got time to kill between now and my next appointment. Also, I have a nice bottle of port you clearly need and I'm willing to share. I blink in shock at the offer. Why would you care? Gives me something to do. She shrugs. And in all honesty, I would do anything to shut you up. That sobbing is killing my business. That, and I'm bored. Her tone is more teasing than accusatory. With some of the clients acting like carpenters, banging at me as if I were a table in the making, it's nice to have a chat every once in a while. You seem interesting enough. I don't think you'd want to hear it. I shudder, not sure how open I could be about my sexuality, and it seems my embarrassment is read by her like an open book. Why? Because you like a bit of woven cock? Who am I to judge? I once slept with a female rhino, finding her hoo-ha was trickier than you think, let me tell you. She shrugs merrily, and I laugh at the absurdity of that statement. Uh, a rhino? A long time ago, and not true. Anyway, the female takes a long huff from the pipe. I saw your roommate storm past me a moment ago. A purposeful gate like that can only be fueled by a lover's quarrel. Wouldn't exactly call it that. Call it whatever you want, and as I said, I'm willing to lend you my ear. Okay, I could use a chat. I nod in agreement. In truth, I don't really want to be alone right now, and if this is to become my new home, seeing as she's a regular, building a report like this early on might be a good idea. Stay here, I'll fetch the port. I'd invite you to my room, but it's not a place someone of your stature should be seen entering or leaving. True to her word, she returns shortly with a bottle in one paw and two crystal chalices in the other, her pipe securely held between her lips. For a moment, I'm reluctant to open the door to our room, petting the handle as if to check if it won't burn my hand. Whatever's the matter? She asks in confusion, and I finally realize that all those freakouts are just in my head. N nothing I shake my head and push the door open. I doubt that cosmic fart would manifest anything for the both of us to witness. As she places the glasses onto the cupboard, she grabs the bottle and pours us around, swishing the pipe about in an elegant way which leaves a soft trail of smoke behind. Mind if I smoke here? Or are you seriously that averse to it? What do you mean? That spectacle with the window. She bobs her head towards the door. Not the first time a snobby neighbor complained. Oh, no, no, I don't mind. I shake my head in embarrassment as I try to figure out how to get the lights going. That was uh, something else. Hmm. She narrows her brows with a slight smirk. Here, let me help you. The female approaches one of the candles and puffs into the pipe, causing it to flare up. She lights up the wick with it, and thus the lights return to the room. I watch as she gracefully walks from one candle to the other, lighting them all up in a similar fashion until finally she returns to the table and nods towards a chair. Shall I sit here? Please make yourself comfortable. 
I replied through a smile while she passes me one of the filled up goblets. So, tell me that story of yours. Which story? The one that's long and improper. Mama wants to hear it. Are you sure? I honestly don't have that much time, kid, so let us better not waste it. She sighs in mild annoyance, huffing another cloud of smoke away. I smile and nod, taking a deep breath and even deeper gulp from the cup. I begin as I should, with me being naked and covered in blood at a tree in the forest to her mild surprise expression, but she doesn't bat an eye. I explain everything that transpired in turn and trying to leave out details that might put the tribe in jeopardy, the politics, the war, I just paint a good enough picture of everything that related directly to me. But mostly, I focus on my budding relationship with Rannoch and my current gripe I have with the wolf. I don't know how long it takes for me to cover everything leading up to our trip, but she seems interested enough for me to not pause, nor is she interrupting me with questions. She just listens, taking in my comments with either nod or a smile, intertwined with long puffs from her pipe. Finally, I relay the expedition of ours, which holds her captive with her eyes gleaming in part with curiosity but also slight envy. It seems she doesn't get to enjoy much wholesomeness in her life. Either way, at first it's hard to get into the sexual details of the story, but she puts me at ease with a simple laugh and a reminder of what she does for a living. No point being coy or bashful in front of a prostitute. To be honest, sharing the details of my first time with Rannoch, even though marred by what transpired immediately after, feels nice. Feels like the good type of bragging one does with a friend. In truth, telling her any and all of this feels really good, almost as if I unloaded part of the burden. But now that my story's done, I simply hope for an outsider's perspective. So, that's pretty much it. I finish dipping my lips in my chalice. He strung me along all this way, only to drop the truth on me by accident. That is some serious entitlement issues you have, my boy. But what? I mean... It's expected given your status, but still. Nothing I can't fix. Let me tame this shrew. First of all, do you pleasure yourself? What? I blurred out in shock, my face slowly matching the burgundy of the port. Oh, shut it, kid. You're talking to a whore. I don't see any relevance. Of course you don't. I'm sure you have never rubbed one out only to be suddenly hit with a massive guilt. It's normal. She shrugs, her voice allayed with pity. You have no idea how many guys I had to consult immediately after they were done. Half of my sessions end with tears. That doesn't make it any better. It's worse, in fact, that his sudden honesty comes from a post-orgasm feeling of guilt. You are really oversimplifying things, seeing the world in terms of black and white. The female scoffs, switching her cross legs and pouring herself the last part of the port from the bottle. Just because someone's nice to you doesn't mean that they're sexually into you. Just because someone's sexually into you doesn't mean that they're interested in you romantically. You're talking as if he owes you something, even though so far it seems that you've been getting plenty enough care with nothing asked of you in turn. But he promised. And do you honestly believe that he never intended to keep that promise? She asks challengingly, raising one brow and forcing me to hang my head. Are you willing to sit here, look straight in my face, and say it was all a lie? I close my eyes, a frown taking over my expression. Maybe not. Maybe he did mean it once. But he then led me on. That's what you say. And truth be told, I've seen this over and over again. People ignoring the other person. Who they are. What they want. What's important to them just because in their little head, they're the main character. Their life is a well-scripted play, the world a stage. Everyone and everything must bend to their will. They are the only things that matter, and everything that ever happens happens to them alone. Her harsh words cause me to wince, and a realization floods my mind. To this day, he thinks he's the only one who lost everything, but I was no better off. I was happy with him, and... We could have been happy together. I'm ignoring his pain, his suffering, as if it didn't even exist. I have been doing that a lot as of late, 
and that realization makes my heart drop to my stomach. I'm no better than Tano. I've been focusing only on myself. Of course you did. We all do. But there are times when we need to understand that other people have their own feelings and priorities. You ignoring them for the sake of your wants is proof enough that you're not mature enough for a relationship. You see someone attractive and think that you'd want to be with them and hey, they might even give you a time of their day. But the moment their priorities, the ones they've always had, and you yourself decide to ignore, crop up, take first place as they ought to, suddenly you're being led on. That's not how the world works, honey. That's not how people work. And there it goes. A pit growing inside my stomach and suddenly turns into a void ready to swallow me whole. I'm being chastised by a prostitute, but worse yet, she has a point. I'm not ready for a relationship and neither is he. I'm lost, emotionally unstable, and very focused on any speck of happiness I can get in this miserable situation I have found myself in. I've been putting my own needs above those of others, but... But why the lies? Why pretend everything's fine when it actually isn't? Sparing the person you care for some pain isn't a slight. It's an act of kindness, even if misguided. Brutal honesty is just that, brutal, enacted without care for your feelings or strength to bear it. Friends who hide behind brutal honesties don't look for a way to build you up, but rather for means to knock you down. I... I guess? It's very bad advice. I sigh heavily, somewhat conceding to her point. But it's not entirely like that. He just doesn't treat me like an equal, constantly omitting stuff as if I were a child. And have you asked yourself what you have done to warrant such treatment? She looks to me with a slight a taunting smile. Respect is earned, boy, not given. If you truly believe he's malicious, I have no idea why we're even having this conversation. But it seems you give him credit which only means he's shielding you from the hard truths because he doesn't believe you can handle them. If that's the case, then that's on you to prove him wrong, and trust me, he will be glad for it. Why should I have to prove myself to someone who doesn't trust or respect me? I think that's going a bit too far. He does trust you and respects you, just not in everything I'd imagine. Her expression goes colder as she raises one brow, and I nod reluctantly. With a mindset like that, you'll end up hurt and alone, with no one else to blame but yourself. That sort of domineering behavior will inevitably push everyone away. I know I wouldn't be able to deal with that. That's why I ran off. It's better to be a whore than someone's afterthought. A distinct knocking draws our attention towards a corridor. And that would be me. She says, correcting her dress and grabbing the empty chalices and bottle. Honestly, kid... If anyone had a friend like yours to cry about, the world would be a happier place. You think I'm selfish? A little bit bratty, but given what happened to you, that's quite understandable and easy to forgive. If only you'd extend that courtesy to those around. A stranger saved your life, sheltered, clothed, and fed you at great personal risk, showing time and time again nothing but kindness. I trust that person with my own life, as they've proven beyond any doubt to be good for it. Anything else is just you whining. But... See? Your lips are moving, and you're about to complain again. She winks, approaching the door, and I decide to help her open it, as her paws are full. Just as I'm about to turn the handle, I stop and look at her with one last thing I have to say. Thank you for listening and the questionable advice. Anything to stop your ear-splitting sobbing? The female smirks teasingly. But in all seriousness, I'm happy I was able to help. Not really. What about you? Do you need help? I ask, wondering if perhaps I could somehow repay her kindness. You're willing to take care of this one for me? She nods teasingly towards the door. He's a big, well-endowed leopard. A bit sloppy in bed, but a generous lover. Hmm? I laugh uncontrollably, and she flashes her brow. Thought so? Your lightheartedness is inspiring and surprising. Are you really happy? You mean happy being a whore? Yes, it's my choice. I have a roof over my head, food on my plate, and drink in my glass. 
I meet people, some quite interesting, might I add. She smiles widely, and I cannot help but blush at the veiled compliment. And I'm free, free from my abusive family, free from forced marriage, free to travel and go wherever the wind blows. The fake morality this world tries to impose on us is just another form of prison, one meant for your mind and body. I don't intend to be a prisoner ever again for as long as I live. Well said. I chuckle. I didn't expect this conversation to be this enlightening. You mean because I'm a whore? She mocks me teasingly, rolling her eyes and swirling the edge of her dress. That's when we both shudder, slightly at the louder banging on the far-off door. I better go, he's getting impatient. Impatient customers tend to be less generous, both in coin and in bed. And with that, I open the door and she steps outside, leaving me alone with quite a mindful to process. Oh, there you are, handsome. I'm sorry, I was just freshening up. Her voice echoes down the hallway. Fucking finally, I have an erection the size of my arm, woman. My, someone's quite eager. I want three silvers against a die sharp, and then caved in his muzzle. I need to fuck now. I hear her chuckling as they disappear from the corridor into the confines of her room. As open-minded as I try to be, I don't think I could stay here and listen to her orgasmic moans and groans while another horny male destroys her all over the room. Nope. Just as I hear the bed jump with a loud thud, I decide to leave for the main hall and await Rannoch's return there. As I descend the rickety stairs towards the main hall, I'm greeted with only a few patrons scattered around the hall. It's quite empty for obvious reasons, and only Sylph seems to be running the bar. I approach the counter trying to locate Rannoch in hopes he's simmering here somewhere over some ale, but it seems he has left. Did you see my companion? I ask the bunny with a slight worry, and she puts down a cloth with which she was cleaning some tankards. The broody wolf, he ordered moonshine and left to catch some air. Is that safe? Safe? She blinks as if she didn't understand the question. Is there anywhere that hulking beast wouldn't feel safe? I cannot help but chuckle at the remark, but still look to her with concern. I guess, but you know what I mean. Not really, no. She smirks teasingly. You have nothing to worry about, sugar. He'll be fine. We've got night watch all over town. If anything, they'll be questioning what he's doing out this late. Speaking of, what time would you say it is? It's the hour of the wolf, funny enough. How long past midnight is that? Three hours, give or take. She shrugs, so it's three in the morning. Maybe I should go after him. Bad idea. The girl shakes her head slowly, causing her ears to flop. I half expect the guards to bring him back here for snooping around. Better you stay here if they do. Foreigners skulking around the streets at night aren't exactly a good look. True. I mutter slightly unnerved. I didn't even think about this. Oh god, what if he gets thrown in jail, or worse? What if he decided to simply leave me here? Did he take the gold? I didn't pay attention. He abandoned you. Nope, no. That's not who Ranaka is. He might be dumb and insensitive at times, but he would not leave me here just like that. Besides, he asked me to collect myself, and that's what I should do. Everything okay, sugar? Shit, if the bunny's picking up on my nerves, I must be really fucked. Yeah, just a bit anxious. Couldn't sleep well. Ah, uh, you're a nervous traveler. I'm not a nervous traveler. It's quite common for a nervous traveler to deny that he's a nervous traveler. Luckily, it's something that I can help with. Lavender is... No lavender. I blurt out in panic, causing the bunny to shudder. The last thing I need is another dream sequence. Uh, sorry, I... I can't stand lavender. Makes me sick. I clumsily make up an excuse, embarrassed that I startled her, but she quickly dismisses it with a kind smile. Ah, uh, why didn't you say so? I know just a thing, to say with a hint of gin. She claps her tiny paws and rushes off through the side door. She returns momentarily with a bubbling pot and a cup. 
I look inside it and there's some dried leaves she quickly soaks in boiling water. The floral scent hits my nose immediately. Chamomile and valerian root. We brew it a lot while it cools, simply breathe it in. She gesticulates towards her nose and I do just that. In the meantime, she takes two small glasses and fills them up with a clear liquid. Once poured, she pushes one towards me and I look to her in confusion. What now? Now, we drink the gin. She smiles toothily, clinking her glass with mine. Amused, I shake my head and down the shot. The gin is less smooth than the Everclear, but leaves a pleasant herbal aftertaste, almost as if one swallowed mouthwash. One more, for good measure. The bunny fills the glasses once again and raises hers to a quick toast. Yamas! To us. I nod in cheerful agreement and down the gin goes. I grimace slightly as the initial novelty wears off, and indeed this feels like chugging lestering. Hehe, <laughs> takes some getting used to, but here. She now fully nudges the steaming pot. Should be good enough to sip now. Thanks. I nod once more and allow her to return to her duties. She continues to clean up the silver and deposit it in the drawers, while I try to drink the floral brew while it's still hot. It doesn't taste much of anything. There are some distinct leafy, nature-esque flavors to it, but otherwise it's just hot water. But despite all of that, I do feel much calmer and relaxed now. I don't know how much time passes, but eventually I move to one of the tables watching the room finally clear out. The last to these customers is being dragged off by his screaming wife, calling him a no-good layabout and hitting him repeatedly with a folded apron, while the last man standing, a rather small and stature Tigiri youth, had to be chased out by Sylph. I look at the window, and although the sky is still dark, there is an undeniable subtle glow of twilight somewhere in the distance. I try not to worry, but it's hard not to with the passing of time. There you are. I rise, seeing the wolf finally enter through the back door. What are you doing down here? Ranok blinks in surprise, stopping a few paces short of my table. I was waiting for you. I thought you might have gotten arrested. No such luck. The city is calmer than the name tree grove. I just needed some air. You feel any better? I should be asking you that. He scoffs in mild amusement, and I nod. Heh. <laughs> True. I feel better now. Had some help. I jiggle the now empty cup and the wolf sighs. Good. I know this is all hard, and I don't want it to be harder than it needs to be. Agreed. I cannot promise to take you back. My personal wants and feelings are not important. Your safety and that of my friends takes priority. He says in an uncertain voice, taking few reluctant steps towards me, and I pat the table. I understand, even if I hate this decision with every part of my being. That makes the two of us. The wolf scoffs, taking his seat opposite of me. Can you truly promise that you will come back? No. He exhales heavily. Between today and next year, there's so much that could happen. I could be dead or injured or imprisoned. I frown at the suggestions but allow him to continue. I thought my life was grounded, structured, and focused, but everything fell apart the moment I met you. I'm not saying that you're the cause of it all, but... It's like I was living in a bubble and your arrival burst it, opening my eyes to mayhem and peril lurking at every corner, not just for you, but for any of us. For the first time in my life, I don't know what to do or what's going to happen. All I can do is mitigate the damage that's already done. Again, he issues a strained sigh, and I'm struggling with the urge to comfort him. That's when his green, full of determination eyes drill into my very soul. I don't know the future, but I can promise you this. As long as I am able, I will look for a way to return to you. Not a single night will pass when I won't miss you, and the sheer idea of us reuniting one day will be all the hope I need to get through whatever comes. Heh, <laughs> I like you better like this, when you're honest. I smile, thinking to the conversation I had with our neighbor, deciding to lean onto her wisdom. And I'm sorry I wasn't strong enough to bear it before, 
I bet holding stuff up must have eaten at you. There's nothing that I wouldn't do for my friends. I would lie, steal, kill, or cheat if I had to. He shakes his head in dismissal, and I decide to butt in with a half-joke. You didn't steal for Tano. Because I didn't have to. The wolf states plainly. We could have run off without a single coin, just as many other wolves did. Had this been his proposition all along, perhaps I'd even fool myself into believing his intentions. Why did he want to steal the gold then? I don't know and I don't care. Ranok pouts in slight annoyance. If Tano was so desperate to get out of our village, if he hated our people so much and was done with his place in our tribe, what stopped him from running after we broke up? He poses a question and I raise my brow. His life is a living nightmare of his own making. What for is he enduring all of this? Wait, what? When we were together, all he could talk about is running off. But if I broke his heart, if I truly were the only string tying him down to our tribe, why did he stay? He didn't stay for the love of me, nor to spite me, really. I leaned in closer, looking at him intently. Why did he stay, then? My a bit too eager a question causes him to retreat slightly. I, I don't want to talk about it, not now. But... I think it should be obvious that Tano's aim was never to abscond on his own, but to make me run away with him. The more damage that would cause the better, pilfering my father's coffers, breaking my oaths, abandoning my birthright. I don't understand. What for? I blink in confusion. It doesn't matter. The wolf shakes his head in defeat. Some wounds are really hard to revisit, especially when they're still festering. Tano's betrayal hurts more than I dare to admit. He betrayed my feelings, my trust, and my confidence, all because I told him no. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to prod. I mutter awkwardly, feeling guilty that I actually made judgments about the situation I am still not fully aware of. It's fine. I'm really just done with that relationship, if I can even call it that. One of his schemes failed. By now, I'm sure he has another. You think he has some sort of grand plan? Tano always has a plan. He sneers. That wolf makes contingencies inside of plots, hidden within schemes. He's always two steps ahead of everyone. I would admire him if I didn't fear him so. You're not serious. I smile, weakly looking to his narrowed eyes with worry. I wish I wasn't. Tano's not malicious. No, I never said he was. He shrugs. Malicious people are fools who act on impulse. Tano's calculated coldly so. He didn't do anything to hurt you, did he? Aside from trying to unmask me as defective in front of the entire tribe... No. But I never gave him any reason to. Our personal history is ours alone, and he knows this. That's why I try to keep Vol and Verissa out of it. Tano is exceptionally clever, and despite not realizing it, the tribe needs him, now more than ever. I nod in understanding. He really does care about his people more than about himself. He cares enough to ignore his personal wants and qualms. I feel so... Petty in comparison. I'm sorry that I used your past with him against you. It was uncalled for. You confided in me and I betrayed that trust. I'm not trying to make an excuse. I hope you can forgive me. I just felt hurt. After our joint confession, everything just happened so fast and took a turn I just didn't expect. It's fine, Kaelin. He says tenderly using that pet name he gave me and ruffling my hair. For some reason, that nickname makes me feel safe and warm. It feels mine, my own. Utterly removed from everything and anything that came before. We both fucked up. I should have been more open about things from the start. But it doesn't come easy. At least, I can understand why. For what it's worth, I really do care about you. And the l I love you. Don't worry about it. I shake my head softly in dismissal. 
I don't think we should revisit confessions made in the heat of the moment. You have found me in quite the ordained way during a crucial juncture in your life. Now you came back from battle, facing potential death. Obviously, your investment in me will exceed anything rational, and I... I cringe slightly. I am devoid of any memories or direction in life, with the only constant to ground me being you. My devotion, even if foolish, comes from necessity. I don't have any other choice. It is as if fate forced us together. And you don't like that. He concludes in a solemn tone, and I tilt my head. Not necessarily. I just don't enjoy thinking that all of this is orchestrated and not really resulting from our own choices. Would you even find me remotely interesting had we met in a tavern? Would I be so lenient if you weren't my only guardian? I see where you're coming from. Those same questions bothered me over and over again when it came to Tano. Oh? I looked to him with curiosity, hoping he'd elaborate, but the wolf sighs reluctantly. I really don't want to get into all of that again. There's too much to unpack there. But know this. With Tano, I always felt deep down that there's an ulterior motive. With you, with you, all of my instincts simply shut down. And that's good? No, not really. But for someone like me, who has his guard up all of his life, who's always on high alert, letting yourself get completely lost is refreshing. Liberating even, as silly as it sounds. I smile, blushing slightly at this revelation, but I don't want to dwell on it too much. There's more important stuff to worry about, as I look towards the brightening skies. I think we should head up and salvage whatever's left of the night. We better. There's a lot of things that we need to get sorted today. He nods in agreement. Shall we start at dawn, then? No need to get up that early. Might as well not sleep at all. But we shouldn't tarry beyond the second hour. Good. Sylph? I look towards the bunny, who's been clearing out the last bits of cutlery left by the guests. Yes, Trigger? Can we please be woken up on the second hour? Sure thing, Sugar. She nods happily as we get up. I'll pass it on to the boss. Thanks. I bow to her in gratitude and bid Rannoch upstairs. Come, let's get some sleep. To be continued. Huh. Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. The tiger shaped elephant. So, you finally met the big topic of contention in this whole update, the Tigress. And a lot of the criticism with this character comes from the fact that she kind of shows up to tell you the reader and not Kaylin, because she it's very much speaking directly to you that you're entitled and that the way Rannoch is treating you is beyond reproach. And that you shouldn't be bitching about the fact that, you know, he kept this secret from you. And that he's going to leave you in Strambard. And basically they should be happy that you were put into indentured servitude. And although that's not very um, <laughs> explicitly said, it's basically said that he apparently put you in the lap of luxury. And that you're just complaining because you want to complain. And while it is true that technically Kaylin is literally two weeks old with little to no memories whatsoever, um, and that he did latch onto Rannoch for comfort and safety because he's one of the first few wolves that he met that was actually nice, it's not uh, fair to say that technically Rannoch didn't do the same. And once again, this brings up Tano, where... With Tano, even though that he knew that, you know, there was an ulterior motive with Tano because he just said that, he still, you know, stayed with him because he felt safe and he was horny and he, he was getting something out of it too. So he can't say that Tano was using him because he was also using Tano. And I don't, because I am not the writer, I hesitate to say that Tano wasn't hurt by all this and that it wasn't some grand scheme. But I would like to think that Tano isn't just this antagonizing character 
and that he actually liked Rannoch during what was happening. And that his ulterior motive, as you know, Rannoch said, wasn't just to take ta uh, Rannoch away from the village and you know cause some trouble. It was actually to take this guy that he liked, who also liked him, and you know to have a life outside of the village. And you kind of need money in order to start a new life. So, you know, that's where the money aspect probably came from. So, yeah. And to me, it would be obvious that the reason that Tano didn't leave the village is because Rannoch is still there. And that he probably still feels something for him. So, I don't believe that the whole, like, oh, Tano didn't, you know, didn't leave. And it wasn't because of me. No, it probably was because of you, dude. And, and we have seen that Rannoch is a little dense at times. And that he kind of misses the point of what's happening, you know? So... I'm pretty sure Rano, uh, not Rano, uh, Tano still had something for Rannoch. But then again, you know, the writer could just say, no, he didn't. And just write something completely different. Which does bring up the whole, oh, I always felt that Tano had, you know, ulterior motives thing. But yeah, uh, circling back to the Tigris. It does feel a little on the nose. Um, because I kind of feel that the update could have just ended right up to the point where either the shadows appear or, you know, when they go to sleep. Because at this point, Kaelin is already sort of accepting the fact that he's going to stay there. And Rannoch is already just saying, you know, I'm not going to budge. And it kind of felt like, okay, fine. Allow Kaelin to come to that, you know, thing himself. You know, to say that, okay, fine, yeah, I accept it. I am going to stay here and wait for your return or... You know whatever happens and I'm going to try to make a life for myself here and you know grow as a person and that would have been interesting because it would have allowed uh, the character to flourish without Rannoch's um, involvement it would have also allowed for Rannoch to also flourish without um, Kaelin but also with the need to see the human again to basically come to the, his own realization that yes he needs his human nearby even if there's a war or whatever going on even if there's politics within the tribe that threaten to you know tear it apart he needs a human to his you know to his side because up to this point actually up to before I think Rannoch arrived back from you know the little skirmish that he had it kind of seemed like the story was setting it up so that Kaelin and Rannoch were supposed to be together and were supposed to, you know, build off of each other and their relationship would change the tribe for the better. But right now it kind of seems like a like it's reversing course and saying like no 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 that all of that is in your head. Um and, and yeah. It just uh it it's giving off a weird vibe like it's being written in order to sort of show that R Rannoch is in the right. But then again, it could just be sort of like a ploy. Where it's like, no, 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 don't worry. It's actually not that. Where Rannoch isn't actually in the right and Kaelin does have to go back to the, the you know, the village. Well, the, the tribe. Because he's actually important to its overall success or continuation. Whatever you want to call it. However, that would also bring into point the fact that um, you kind of wrote this out to sort of, I don't know, um, to show that Kaelin is being a little brat and that all this time uh, Rannoch's little um, hospitality was just, you know, being nice. And I don't know, it would feel really weird if all of a sudden in the next update, it was like, oh no, Kaelin has to go back with you. You know, just... It would be kind of like bowing down to criticism, I guess. Like, you already said, okay, no. He's gonna have to stay. Then fine, let him make him stay. Keep him in Strambard or wherever it is he's gonna ultimately end up in. And allow them to be separated and to develop as two separate characters on their own. Or do a time skip or whatever. I don't care. 
don't sort of say, haha, psych, he's actually going to go back. Because that would be kind of like, oh, wh what was this for? Th this is kind of pointless now. What was the whole little scolding of the reader and of Kaelin for? If you wanted to show that the tribe comes first, which is a very weird thing to do, because it's... It's very... It's comparing it with very real-world things where it's like, oh yeah, the country comes first. But, um, yeah. If you're trying to show that, at least with the tribe, you could have done that a little differently. Where, uh, Kaelin does come to the realization that, yes, the tribe is very important. So I should do whatever I can to help it. Not... Um... Your life is not that important, so I need to get rid of you. But I, I know that's a very oversimplification thing of what's happening, but that's how it kind of comes off. And the whole, like, oh, you should be grateful that, you know, he just put a collar on you and that you had to act like a, you know, like an uneducated primate. That you had to allow people to treat you that way, etc., etc., because, I don't know, it's very hard to articulate without sounding, like, condescending and, uh, and uh, I don't know. What I'm trying to say is that the, the, the Tigress's messages were very problematic and could have probably been worded differently. Also, the whole hard truths thing. I vehemently disagree with that because... Why would you want somebody to sugarcoat things for you when they can just... Well, no, not when they can just bluntly tell you. But um, when you sugarcoat something, it's because you don't trust that person enough to accept the truth. And if this whole thing is about, you know, accepting the truth that, you know, you can't be with Ranok right now or whatever, why... Why would you say that, oh no, hard truths are just being used by bad people to bring you down? No, that sounds very personal like it's not like it's coming from something else other than just to try to you know i don't know just show that ranok sugarcoating things for you was good because i firmly believe that at least being blunt with someone when they need to hear it is good and that's kind of what verissa and vol do where they're usually very blunt with uh ranok Basically telling him, like, hey, stop being stupid. Stop acting like a pup. You know, you have to do this. This is this is your duty. This is what is this is what is expected of you and certain things like that. And like it would mean that uh Ranok uh, not Ranok, that Varissa and Vol are what? Like they're bad friends to Ranok. That they're terrible people because they're usually very blunt with him and they usually kind of set him straight. Or it is saying that hard truths are only bad when certain people tell them to you. When you don't hear what you want to hear. Because then that's not a hard truth. That's just either sugarcoating or just telling you what you want to hear. And that's telling you what, what you want to hear is bad because it's just sort of reinforcing bad things usually. Usually. It's sort of like when you need to hear something but somebody else tells you exactly what you want to hear and you don't hear what you actually need to hear. Or you're not told what you need to be told. It would be sort of... I don't want to give... Exa I don't want to go too hard into this, okay? I am not a visual novel writer. I just read stuff. So I don't have any real big say in how you should be writing your story. But it just, as a person that reads and has been reading a lot of visual novels, different ones, it, it feels really weird. At least with this story, this whole part feels really weird. It feels like a justification for Rannoch's actions and for the tribe's actions, and not sort of like a, a natural way to doing it, sort of like a forced way to do it. But anyway, um... So, for the people that are watching or listening, um, what do you guys think? Do you agree with the Tigress? Do you agree with me? Or do you have your own opinions on what's going on? Because 
like some people feel like this was sort of like gaslighting and some people are, are totally agreeing with the tigress I, I don't know why they would because I uh, but yeah so again comments write it down say what you think uh, this is a safe space for you to vent what you think if you agree with her then fine if you disagree with her then also fine if you have your own opinion then also fine and um but yeah but uh thank you all for watching slash listening if you would like to play far beyond the world yourself you can find it over on itch uh you can find a direct link to it from the creator's twitter page which i will link down in the description i will also link down for their patreon if you want to support the project and as you can see on the bottom they also have a discord if you want to you know join their server and talk about it there and I guess that's it for now, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.